Hello, my name is John Strabel. I'm a principal product manager here at Couchbase. And welcome to Connect 2021. Today's session that I'll be going over is about creating value with eventing CI CD pipelines. So let's just jump right into it. This particular session is focused on the developer. And here's our brief agenda. We're going to have an introduction and overview. And then the next two sections, we'll be talking about eventing development in the UI, how to do it, and also some of the drawbacks. Then we'll move on to a quick demo on using the UI to move your eventing functions or lambdas from development to production, and also discuss archiving a little bit. The next session, number five, we'll be automating a CI-CD pipeline, walking through some of the commands that we would use. And then finally, we'll cap it off with a demo when we script some things and we put it all together. Okay, with the advancements in Couchbase Server 7.0, eventing can be a first class component in your CI-CD pipelines, and you can break away from manual development if you want to. We'll be talking a little bit about moving eventing functions from development to production, both in a manual method and also in an automated method via the eventing REST endpoints. And we will discuss a bit about archiving. I'm gonna assume you already know a lot about eventing. So we're gonna do a fairly quick recap here. When we create an eventing function, we invoke a pop-up dialogue editor where we will essentially uh, specify a listen to location, an eventing storage scratch pad, both key spaces, eventing name, deployment free feed boundary could be everything or from now, optional description, and then we get in some settings. Uh, probably the most important would be workers where we could up our performance. And then we have some bindings, bucket aliases. Um, this particular one specifies an alias of source underscore call to mean source collection that allows us to write back to our source key space. Um, another URL alias, a different type, uh, pulls exchange rates from a publicly available API. And then once we save that, when we're creating a function, um, we implement our business logic in JavaScript or our Lambda. And that essentially is everything that you can do in the UI to create a function. Now, there are some drawbacks when we use the UI. So when we move functions from development to production, it's a manual process. It could be error prone if certain things don't line up, whether it's the um, listen to location or the eventing storage, or perhaps uh, it's the bindings to a URL binding or a binding to a key space or bucket. Um, also, we don't have a direct integration into a version control system. Okay, here I have two lists. One's a development cluster, the other is a production cluster. And we're assuming we, we have the same function on each and we did some work on the dev system and we wanna move it to the production system. Well, sometimes you have different settings, like a different listen to location or a different eventing scratch pad or storage. Maybe you up the number of workers for more performance and maybe your bindings have to change. Uh, because if you change your listen to location and you're doing a source bucket uh, mutation update, you'd have to actually change that particular binding. So this particular impedance mismatch can be error prone when you're doing manual uh, moves through the UI because you've got extra steps besides just an export where we export our function, we locate it in the downloads, then we copy it to the production cluster. And if needed, we also put it in some version control system. Then over on the production cluster, we pause or we um, undeploy the function, then we import it, then we update the needed settings if we have that mismatch. And then we end up deploying our 
um, eventing function, and we're good to go. But it is sort of a, you know, a manual error prone process. So we're talking about, I have four things that I have to change when I do the import. And I have to remember to change these things. So let, let's actually look at a live system and see how this all works. Okay, here we have an eventing function with a name, external underscore rest, underscore via, underscore curl, underscore get. It is actually an example from the eventing documentation. Um, just so that you know, it has the exact same settings that we just went over, um, data source, eventing metadata from these particular buckets, and we want to be able to write back to the listen to location. Um, and we have our Lambda, which is fairly complex code um, because I'm using timers, I'm pulling some things out. Uh, not gonna go into details. You can look at the actual eventing example if you wanna see exactly what this is doing. We're more focused on moving this from development to production. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna export it and oh, gee, it, it went into my file system so I can show it in the finder. Yes, okay, I have something here that I need to move over to another system in order to be able to um, allow it to work. So let's, uh, let's just go to that other system. Okay, we're on the other system. This is now the prod cluster, okay? And we have the same function, but it's time to see this is this is deployed. So hmm, I'm gonna have to undeploy the, the function. And once it's undeployed, then I can import um, my new function that I just moved over via SCP or dropping it in a shared NFS serve. Um, so let's just go ahead. I'm going to just delete that function. We're going to import it and we'll find, um, I believe that was the one that we exported. So in it comes now, however, um, it's, it's a little bit interesting because I know on my production, I want to listen to this. And I know that, uh, on my production, um, I moved my venting scratch pad to here, but this uh, also, I wanna update my listen to location through the function. So I have to remember to update this. And yeah, as you can see, yeah, maybe I, I could forget to do things. Oh, one other thing I had to do is I wanted that. Okay, so we're, we're all good. We say, hmm, fine there. And then we go in here, everything's hunky-dory, and we can end up deploying our function again. Okay, a little bit of work. And as you can see, some potential for error. Okay, let's talk about how we automate some of this stuff. Um, we have the eventing REST API. The very first command that I show here is a uh, very important command. Um, we're just going to actually export the eventing function. We can check the status of how things are running. Um, so this particular thing would be checking the status on the production server. We have um, six possible statuses. And then we can do other, other options. Um, for instance, we're undeploying um, the production function here. We can uh, update the pr production function by passing it this particular file that we exported from the dev function. Now, sometimes this process can fail if we have that impedance mismatch, like if we have a different listen to location or a different eventing storage, okay? So it's easier to match these values in both your dev and production systems. However, if they need to be different, um, you could create a dummy empty key space on your dev box so that you could get things dialed in on the dev box and it would all work. Okay, we're gonna start from scratch again because we did have that impedance mismatch. So this is example two. Um, here, what we're going to do is we're going to save the special configs that uh, each eventing function has um, both 
the dev and the prod environment. So that's two commands. Um, and, you know, here we go. Well, that's the dev environment. That's the prod environment. And then we'll undeploy the development function. Make sure that that's undeployed. And now what we're going to do is we're going to update the development <laughs> environment with the production settings. Then we can export it as it needs to be in the production. Then we'll update the development back with its own development settings. It seems a little bit, uh, a little bit crazy to do to try to prevent us from having to do a manual UI step, um, but it does work. Then we can check the status on the production cluster, make sure that it's undeployed. And if it's not undeployed, we can undeploy it, the last line here. Um, then we can do a full update of the function. We don't have to delete it. It will overwrite, replace when it's undeployed. Um, so what we're doing here is we're taking that file and we're overwriting it. And we can update some other things. Now, the depth config isn't the same as the settings. And we'll get into that when we do a live demo. So here I'm updating the worker count and now we're ready to deploy the function because we're golden. Okay, so the last example was a little bit convoluted. So let's simplify this. Um, with Couchbase 7, we now have the ability to extract just the app code, which is really kind of nice. So um, this example, we just check the status of the production box. Okay, fine. And then if we need to pause it, um, if it was deployed, we pause it. And pausing will actually take a, um, a checkpoint so that when it's resumed, you don't miss any mutations. Okay, that's, that's really nice. So what do we do? From the development box, let's just get the app code. And the app code is only the JavaScript code. So we're leaving all the settings the same on both boxes. And we don't have to jump through hoops to do any changes for the listen to location or anything else like that, or enter a password. So we skip dealing with depth config and we skip dealing with the settings. And then we just load what we extracted. Now, one of the key things here is we don't want to use dash D because um, we could mess up the JavaScript syntax. So I'm doing a dash dash data binary, or I could do a dash dash upload dash file. Um, so this will only update the JavaScript. We're in pause state. And then the last step is we just resume. We pick up where we left off and we start processing the last mutation. Nothing's missed. Any timers that were existent, they will fire if their um, arm time is already passed, they'll fire as soon as possible. So this is actually a pretty slick way to do the update that we need. Okay, let's put it all together. So I have three scripts here and um, the example three underscore bar two is really what I want to stress when we get to completing this demo. But let's take a look at the convoluted example, which was um, this particular thing. And what I have done here is, is, is I've made some credentials, okay? So credentials, the server, my cluster, my production port, then my dev server, and then my dev credentials, uh, and then the function that I want to do, okay? Um, this does exactly what, what we were talking about earlier, but first, let's get that all configured, okay? I'm actually on the production box right now. Now let's um, save what our dev configs were from both boxes. Okay, um, we got some information here, and this is what a depth config is. It has your bucket aliases, it has your curl aliases, and it would have constant aliases, plus it has the mapping to the listen to location and the mapping to the scratch pad or the eventing storage. Okay, now let's do a quick diff on 
what's the difference between these two systems? And we can see, hmm, all right, well, we've got uh, the scope data source, scope EMA order. So we had a, a, a difference there, um, and that would be the bucket binding. And then we had a difference in what we were listening to as our um, source collection. So these are things that we need to fix, and that's what, what we call the depth config, okay? Now, the script, as I'm gonna cat on this again, this is the example two. Um, so we, we dumped out some, some data. I, we're gonna make sure that the function on the development box is undeployed and it was already in the undeployed state. So there was no problem there. Um, then I'm going to update the, <laughs> the dev box with the production boxes dev config, okay? Um, so hmm, that's great. So we run this thing and it's happy. Um, then I'm going to export my updated thing Okay, so it's now exported. We have a new file here. It'll be the um, right here. Now I wanna put my dev box back the way it was, okay? Since we just updated it. So we're basically gonna restore things. And so now the dev box is restored. Remember I said this was the convoluted method. Now, another REST API, let's check our status, okay? Well, we're deployed in production. Well, I don't want to be deployed. Um, hmm, I'm going to want to undeploy my production box. Um, I know this says pause, but we're really going to undeploy. And so undeploy, and we can check our status again. And it's undeploying. We, we need to wait till it's stable. In other words, fully undeployed. And this takes about 12 seconds. And now we're fully undeployed. And at this point in time, we can update our function, okay? So we're updating the prod function from what it was that we pulled out of the dev function. And of course, the very last thing is to resume. It's actually redeploy because we aren't doing a pause and resume here. All right, and we can check our status again. It's deploying. And this will take about 15 to 18 seconds. And we will eventually go to the deployed state. Okay, good. So let's clean up some stuff. RM star.json. I don't want any of the JSON files. Now let's take a look at example three, which is much cleaner and much less convoluted. So example three, we have the same credentials here, so I don't have to cut and paste that. Um, we can get the status of the function of the cluster. So let's do that. It's deployed, that's fine. Well, guess what? We wanna pause it because we're gonna update um, the production cluster. So we pause the production system. Now we're gonna grab only the JavaScript over on the dev side, okay? So I just grabbed the JavaScript and this is clean JavaScript, okay? And when I say clean, it's not escaped. You can see it, you could pull this and you could archive this in a, in a revision control system or a version control system, pull it from GitHub. It's just, you know, nice, clean and sweet, okay? And um, let's continue on taking a look at sample three. Um, not that one, this one. Okay. So what we just did is we got the JavaScript from our dev server. If we're in the proper status, we can just check our status. Yeah, it's paused. Well, let's just load the JavaScript into the prod server that we got from the dev server. And in it goes and we stored it and it's in there. Now we can just go ahead and resume our production server. And let's go find our status again. And we're deploying, okay? So we're doing all these items um, via the command line, okay? Now, one of the interesting things about this is 
I am going to actually show, and we'll kind of like do a little bit of proof is in the pudding. Um, we'll walk down here. That's the prod cluster. This is the dev cluster. And anytime we use the REST API, the UIs could get out of sync, okay? So I just want you to, to realize that. And I just did a browser refresh. Now, what I'm gonna do here is this is undeployed. I'm gonna edit this and I'm gonna put in a change, okay? Change, okay? It's just a comment, okay? Save and return. Um, so, and, and that, that says change, okay? But on the prod cluster, we don't have that change. Um, so if I view that, that's the prod cluster. And so we, we've tested out this um, dev cluster. We're completely happy with it, okay? And now it's time to update the code to the other box. And well, one of the things that's kind of um, interesting, I have another function here, RM, we don't need this JavaScript. We'll get rid of that. And then we'll cat this particular function, which is, it's written to actually, um, let's dot shell, sorry about that. It's written to actually um, do some waiting till it's stable. So I can just run this, okay? And so we're just gonna run this blindly because we know it's all set up and it's also got a little bit of checking to make sure that it's safe. So it says, hmm, well, it's in the deployed state. So it knew it was in the deployed state and then it paused it. And then when it actually got to the status of paused, it got the JavaScript from the development system. Then it loaded it into the production system and then it resumed it. And this whole thing should be deployed on the production cluster. I'll just refresh it because you know it's uh, the UI doesn't refresh automatically and uh, let's take a look sure enough there's our change and that concludes the demo portion of this session so i do want to point out vending functions don't look real pretty i removed a ton of javascript that was escaped and put on one new line in order to fit into the json payload that defines this entire function uh, we talked a little bit about depth config. This was a bucket or key space alias. And then this was a URL alias, not shown would be a constant alias. Um, the source buckets that uh, we get our mutations from, and then the eventing scratch pad. And then we have other items like the script timeout or the worker count. Um, the interesting thing about all this is now with version seven, you can go on GitHub and you can look at the schema config. And as long as you follow and adhere um, the actual schema configs, you could build your own functions. You know, best practice, probably just use our REST API endpoints and avoid working directly with the you know, textual syntax for the schemas. Uh, quick recap, we walked through a script for example two and example three. Example two, very convoluted because we were sort of like shoehorning a change in um, in order to get things to work. Example three, and especially the automated version that's a standalone bash utility that, that actually waits for things ready and then updates things. Um, now we have some resources here. Uh, the first link here is the eventing API, which is something that uh, you can go through. There's lots of different functions um, and we went over just a, a small portion of them. Then we have the eventing examples. Um, we used a curl example. Uh, the appendix just lists out some of the work that we did. And this is example two, which is the convoluted example, um, how I set up my credentials and my function name, um, the actual commands that I used. Then we have the interactive example three, which is really easy to kind of follow through. Um, you know, we just check the status, we pause, we grab the app code from the dev server, we load the app code into a, a paused 
um, production server, and then we resume. Um, now the automatic version, it has some code that uh, shows you how to do a little waiter and bash to make sure that we're in a stable state or the state that we need to be in, and then the code itself. Uh, and I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this session.